while I was still exploring the Catholic Church, I was introduced to this accusation that Catholics are cannibals or that they practice cannibalism because of their belief about the bread and wine in Holy Communion transforming into the body and blood of Jesus. I actually had somebody say this to me, somebody I worked with who was Protestant, say this exact thing to me. For the Protestants that make this accusation, I understand, you know, hashtag not all Protestants, they do come by it honestly. Martin Luther uh, used this kind of rhetoric in the Babylonian captivity of the church, you can look that up. And in John Fox's book of martyrs, he describes the Catholic mass as detestable cannibalism. And for me, as I learned more about church history, I was startled by the parallels that this accusation draws with historical events of the very earliest Christians who were persecuted by pagan Romans under this exact same allegation. A Roman rhetorician named Minucius Felix famously made this, this claim and would spread it around to anybody who would listen, especially high-ranking officials uh, within Rome, uh, which prompted responses and explanations uh, of what Christians actually believe in their theology and what they think is going on in their Eucharistic celebration by characters such as Hippolytus and St. Justin Martyr, specifically that a prayer of blessing would be made over the gifts of bread and wine, which then become the body and blood of Jesus. And this reveals two, I would say, very startling things to me. The first is that for Protestants who made and continue to make those kinds of accusations, in a sense, they have more in common with pagan Romans of the ancient world who were bent on murdering Christians than they do with those same persecuted early Christians. And secondly, that the early church going back to the second century practiced something that was just as easily confused with cannibalism as the Catholic mass is confused by some contemporary Protestants today. But setting that aside for a second, what I've never understood about the Protestant interpretation of chapter 6 of John's Gospel, which is this contentious portion of scripture in which Jesus doubles down on this idea that in order to fulfill his saving work, we have to feed on his flesh and blood, and that if we don't, we won't inherit inter eternal life. Um, this interpretation that it's just some kind of symbolism or metaphor is strange to me because it doesn't escape the fact that if he were speaking literally, it would be offensive. Because if you find the literal meaning of those words offensive, then you should also still find the metaphorical meaning of those words offensive. Because as we all know, Jesus did use metaphors and hyperbole. He said, I am the way and the light at one point. And another time he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And those are pleasing images and associations. But what if he said something crazy like, I am the stalker who you went on a blind date with and now I won't leave you alone. My love for you cannot be resisted. <laughs> like any sane person would be like, what? That's, that's weird and creepy. But what if his like PR handler was like, oh, don't worry, it's okay. It's just a metaphor. Wouldn't you still be like, I don't care, that's a weird, disgusting and offensive metaphor. And it says a lot about the person who's using it. If the literal meaning of Jesus' words in John chapter 6 are offensive, the symbolic meaning should be too. If you think it sounds like cannibalism, then metaphorical cannibalism doesn't make it any better. But the thing is, if you spend any time contemplating this, you should realize that it doesn't have anything to do with cannibalism, either the literal or the metaphorical interpretation. Cannibalism is a violent act that requires the uh, the life of someone to be extinguished in the process. In the case of communion, there is no violence and the victim is one who cannot die, whose life is overflowing for those of us whose vitality is in decline. He has life in abundance and now because of the incarnation, that exists in a physical sense. And for those of us who are not merely spiritual but also physical bodies in need of physical replenishment, this can be an antidote to our our situation. Remember, God invented eating as the means by which the body is restored to life. And he has used this mechanism in salvation history. Remember, the sacrificial lamb slaughtered to save the Israelites from the, the last plague in Egypt, the, the angel of death who would pass over their houses if they followed this ritual and they, they sacrificed this lamb. Well, recall that they not only had to sacrifice um, the unblemished lamb, but they also had to eat it. 
There's also God's idea for infants to feed off of their mother's own bodies as a, a beautiful expression of self-sacrificial love as a mother gives of her own body to feed her child. So too, Jesus offers his own body to feed us physically and spiritually. And if God could do that, it would make a lot of sense that he actually literally would do it. And of course, it's silly to say that God couldn't do that. Of course, God can do that. He can transform bread and wine into his body, blood, soul, and divinity so that as they are consumed, they are synthesized into our own bodies. And then we become partakers literally in the incarnation of God. Like the old saying goes, um, you are what you eat. We become Jesus' body, which scripture affirms over and over in multiple passages. So we know that God could do this thing if he wanted to, but would he? Well, there's no point in asking if he approves of the concept of us feeding on his body and blood. He's the one who introduced us to it. Again, whether you think he's speaking literally or symbolically in John 6, he obviously approves of the concept. And since nothing restricts him from being able to make that concept a literal reality, why wouldn't he? But I also find that given what non-Catholics believe about the nature of faith and salvation, it's a strange thing to conclude that what Jesus is instructing us in in John chapter 6, as well as at the Last Supper, is merely a symbolic religious ritual? Because this is something I've heard Protestants accuse Catholics of countless times, that we are trying to work our way to heaven with all of these religious obligations, and that all that is needed is belief in Jesus' sacrifice, and that it has atoned for our sins. But the thing is that whatever it is that Jesus is describing in John 6, he specifically makes it a condition of our salvation. He says that we have to do this thing, either the literal or the symbolic eating of his body and drinking of his blood to gain eternal life. And that if we don't do it, we will not have life in us. So if you take the interpretation that this is all just a symbolic concept and that Holy Communion is a mere ritual of remembrance, then you have to somehow reconcile yourself to the idea that a mere ritual is necessary for our salvation or find yourself in opposition of Jesus's own words and instructions on this. Which is the very thing that Protestants are in the habit of criticizing Catholics for, relying on rituals to work our way to heaven. But we don't think it is a mere ritual. We think that it's, it is what he said it is, the bread of life that enables us to live forever. So maybe Holy Communion isn't just a mere symbolic ritual because such a thing can't be the means of our salvation. Instead, maybe it actually does something to us. Maybe we are made like Christ as his saving sacrifice enters into our bodies, not just as a concept of belief in our minds, but in our physical, our physical selves. Maybe this is how Jesus enters into us and remains in us, just as he says in verse 56. That would make a lot more sense than Jesus saying that a symbolic religious ritual is necessary for us to gain eternal life. I don't think that Catholics or Protestants should be able to get behind that interpretation. Hey, thanks for watching that. If you made it this far, it's either because you fell asleep or because you really like me. And if it's the latter, I feel okay asking if you would consider helping me out by subscribing, liking, sharing, and if you really like me, consider supporting my channel by joining the reinforcements where you can get opportunities to interact with me and others personally. You can sign up at brianholdsworth.ca. And if you're looking to buy or move, consider using Real Estate for Life. They are a network of real estate agents that will share your pro-life and pro-family beliefs, which are pretty important when it comes to making a big decision like finding a house. You can find them at realestateforlife.com.